How's it going, everybody? This is Sean from Panasonic, and welcome to another one of our Lumix Live sessions. So apologies for the, uh, the little bit of a late start today. We've had a couple of technical issues getting YouTube's back end to actually push the stream live, but hey, we fixed it. We're live now. So we have a really fun, exciting conversation today with a number of very highly educated, very uh, you know, prominent people in the, uh, the uh, uh, underwater photography and videography industry. And really, th this is going to be a, a, a really good conversation to kind of either get you comfortable with getting into underwater photography if you've never even looked at that kind of space before. Um, hopefully, you know, go through some of the equipment with, you know, housings, with what kind of Lumix cameras are going to fit great for this. And then we're also going to be showing a lot of, you know, kind of inspirational content. So uh, photographs and we're going to try some videos. Uh, YouTube is, seems to be a little choppy with the video playback today, but uh, we're going to get you guys, uh, you know, kind of going in this in a few minutes. So, like always, if this is the first time you've joined us for Lumix Live, make sure to subscribe, like, and hit the bell icon on the videos that we've got going up here. We go live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, save for today, which we're about five minutes behind, but... Uh, with just all different kinds of content. Some, sometimes we're doing some heavy tech uh, content, you know, new firmware, uh, new product, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, other times we're having inspirational conversations with photographers and, uh, you know, just really kind of having a good interactive conversation with you guys. If you have comments or questions that you guys want to share for anybody on the call, uh, the call on the stream today, uh, drop them in the chat, either below or to the side, depending on the platform you're on, uh, and make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras. This way, I will see it here. Uh, my uh, coworker Jack will also see them in the chat below, and we can get those uh, questions answered for you. So with that, I want to uh, jump over and bring our guests on, and let's get this thing going. How's it going, everybody? It's going awesome. Here. All right, hang it in. <laughs> <laughs> so Joke to be now, here <laughs> now that all the kind of technical issues are out of the way well hopefully out of the way crossing my fingers um i want to give everybody a little bit of a you know kind of introduction as to who we've got here on the stream today uh we've got uh lumix ambassador yokaim yo yokaim did i pronounce that right <laughs> joachim <laughs> joachim Good. Perfect. There we go. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we have uh, uh, John from uh, Icolite, who's VP in uh, product man uh, product development management, right? That's correct. Yep. Yep. Cool. And and we have Robin from Backscatter, uh, one of the uh, uh, media production guys and all around educator, right? <laughs> I think you could probably say that. I guess as long as it comes to underwater camera stuff and maybe a little bit of Star there Wars you. on the side. <laughs> awesome Sorry. cool awesome. <laughs> so um let's let's kind of go around uh and and um have uh give you guys each a little bit of time to kind of give uh background on you uh we always love hearing how you guys got into photography or videography and i think this is a really big uh you know kind of topic point of you know how did you get into this so um let's let's start with you robin Sure. Um, so I've been at Backscatter here for almost six years now. Um, and honestly, I don't have like a really cool superhero origin backstory. I was like most people where, you know, I enjoyed taking photos from time to time, but I certainly didn't call myself a photographer or anything. Uh, and I was in need of a job and I'd gotten to the point where I was kind of like trolling Craigslist and looking for anything. And uh, here in our local area in, in Salinas, Monterey Bay area, is this, you know, underwater photography company company looking for a, a shipper? And I was like, well, you know, like I had some background in that. Like, this sounds cool. You know, let's see what these guys are about. And so I sat down for an interview and it was kind of a good fit. And that's what got me in the door. And then from there, just honestly, like every day from there, I felt like I was learning new stuff. And, you know, before I knew it in, you know, in a fairly short amount of time, I found myself working in the service department here at Backscatter and that was kind of where things kicked into high gear because now it's like daily you've got gear coming across the table and it's not always just the latest, greatest, coolest stuff. It's anything you can imagine from you know, the last several decades of underwater photo. 
because uh, we really do like dive, shoot, and service pretty much everything here. <laughs> and, you know, not even just the stuff we sell, but like everything. And so, you know, within a very, very short amount of time, Backscatter had actually sponsored me to go out and get my open water cert, start diving. And then, of course, we've got this, you know, amazing gear locker with anything you could ever want to shoot. So I, I pretty much got started in underwater activities because of an interest in photography and through my employment here. And that, you know, really just kind of just fueled it for me going forward. So then now here I am as a media producer and I, you know, I get to be the guy on YouTube and in all of our videos explaining to people what we like about all these cameras and what you need to know and how to use them. And so it's, it's pretty cool, but yeah, I, I could say that 100% of my diving career has been as a photographer and that's been a really interesting way to learn, you know, everything related to diving. And uh, uh, boy, if you want to get good at taking pictures real quick, I have learning how to do it underwater will kind of, <laughs> kind of forces you to do so, you know, it's like, whew, it was, yeah, I don't, I don't think I've ever used auto mode on a camera, pretty much manual from birth. So <laughs> like, there yeah, you go. It's, it's cool. It's been a fun learning curve, but yeah, it's awesome. No, no better world to be in, you know? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, uh, uh, John, let's, let's, uh, uh, hear a little bit from you. Um, I know, uh, like the conversation we said, we've got a bunch of different, uh, you know, people here and I think you, you're going to give a really cool, unique perspective. Well, I got into it, not really by choice. This is a, a family company and I was my father. So I had no real intention of getting involved. Um, and then after he passed away, it was like, well, you know, I do like design. I like engineer. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of flying or sharks, so it was kind of an odd thing to get into. <laughs> so I learned to love both of those things real quick. Um, and it, you know, like Robin said, just one thing led to another and it kind of took off and, and you get all this gear in front of you and you're like, and, and even having all that gear in front of you, it's, it's such a daunting task that even I, for a year or two was like, eh, you know, I'm not really gonna to go all in. And I was like, finally one day I said, I'm going to just take all of it on and, We've been uh, going from there, trying to design stuff, and we're scuba divers ourselves. So, so yeah, we just continue to keep the, keep the water off of things. So, <laughs> I like that. So. I like that. Cool. So uh, now, last but not least, uh, uh, I I am I am just constantly flubbing your name. I apologize. We, we can say it together, <laughs> you know, Joachim. Joachim. Yes, you got it. All right. <laughs> How about a little uh, 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 background on you for those that uh, that that haven't followed your work yet? Yeah, uh, I, I'm the opposite to to uh, John. There, I, I start. I want to start diving because of sharks because I've always been fascinated and I loved sharks since you know since I was a little boy. Uh, I. I grew up and I was brought up by the sea, next to the sea, uh, on this coastal little village where I lived. Uh, I took my first diving certificate when I was 10 years old, but it was lot, a lot later where, where I was in Asia, Southeast Asia, 2006, 2007, and I got my first encounter with a manta ray, and I totally fell in love. It was like, suddenly it just, it was there, it appeared like an angel of the blue, and, and you know, they, they are really intelligent, they are really gentle, they are really calm, they have the biggest brain of all fish, they can weigh up to 2,000 kilos, and it just came up to me, I mean, it stayed with me for 45 minutes, and I, I, I totally fell in love with that, I never experienced that before. And when we came up in the boat, uh, there was a guy also from Sweden, unfortunately, he popped up a beer can, knocked it back and threw the beer can over his shoulder into the sea. And he changed my life just then and there for a second. I took a different path in life. So I decided then and there that I'm going to work to raise awareness and to change people's attitudes when it comes to marine debris and marine with focus on plastic now. But we've been working with that since 2007. So, yeah, uh, that's how it started for me. Yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, you know, it, it, sometimes the, 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 the best callings that we have to, to better ourselves and be able to better the world all come from that one kind of just immediate instance or out of need. So kind of kind of going into this, you know, I, I, obviously there's a lot about underwater photography and videography that 
um, I think becomes a bit of a, a kind of barrier for a lot of people because of just either things like sticker shock because of what the assumed costs to get into this are. And then also really like just not, not knowing where to go, like what, what to look at. So I thought we would, you know, kind of really pardon the, the pun dive into this here with, with, you know, really talking about the housings because the, there are those cheap little housings that you can buy online that are just bags that, you know, I, I think a lot of starting users, that's what they think of with this. But John, one of the, the cool things with, with Icolite is that you guys actually really make it easy for a lot of people to get into underwater photography. Um, I know I've, I've messed around with a couple of the housings that we've, um, you guys have sent up to us when we were looking at, I think it was the GX 85. Um, could you give us a little bit of, uh, you know, kind of background on what, what people should look for uh, in a housing and feel free anybody else that's on the call to, to join in if you guys have have points to bring up too. well uh, kind of joking kind of not joking um, one of the first things you want to look for is to keep the water off of the electronics that's goal number one um, so it's, it's, that's once you can get past that hurdle uh, then you have to you know you have to access all the functions that are going to be required um, it, you know, as underwater photographers and videographers, we rely heavily on manual settings for the cameras. And, you know, Panasonic goes through extended lengths to make it very high tech. Um, so you want to be able to access that underwater and you also want to be able to go to depth. So you have to initially keep the water off and then you have to get to get it to depth, which, as you had mentioned, bags, they won't let you go to these depths that you're going to want to go to. Um, and and. Furthermore, is to make it as approachable, obviously as affordable as possible. Um, it used to be back in the day, not even that long ago, that the investment that you'd have to make to produce anything decent looking was astronomical. Um, nowadays, there's so many options out there as far as cameras and, and housings that let more and more people get involved. Um, and to kind of touch on the conservation side of things where you know the more we can see this happening the the more you know it's, it's, out, it's the out of sight out of mind mentality if we can't get it in front of people then they don't see that um and there are a lot of creative people out there um and and you don't want to have a cost point or a complexity point stop somebody from getting involved in, in creating yeah yeah so, you know, when from from looking at that now, there are a ton of different levels for people to get into it. And I think, um, you know, and this is for, for the group, someone who wants to just, you know, kind of just try this and get into it. Um, what what kind of advice do you give them as far as like either the camera, the housing you know, what, what kind of advice do you, do you give someone that wants to just jump into this? Um, anybody can. Well, chime I mean, in. if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump in first. I think, you know, we, we probably talk to the most people on the daily who are in exactly that position because we are we're the largest retailer of underwater photo equipment in the world. Um, and so that's, I, that's one of the number one questions that we get, you know, it's something we easily encounter every day. And I think right now more and more people are spoiled for choice when it comes to getting your foot in the door for underwater photography, because, you know, big cameras tend to be a little more intimidating, right? And the sticker shock, all that, you know, kind of comes along with it. Not everybody's going to jump into a full blown SLR for their first rig. So now we've got all these amazing compact and point and shoot cameras that really, you know, I think used to carry this kind of stigma of being just a point and shoot camera but now we're looking at things with one inch sensors and full manual control shooting 4k 30 video that fit in your pocket you know and really the only difference between something like an lx10 or an lx102 and one of its bigger brothers like a gh5 is the fact that the lens isn't interchangeable you know so it's like if you just want to get started with a really amazing super easy to learn camera that you know, you can do everything cool underwater with just a couple of wet mount external optics. It's kind of never been a better time or never been easier. You know, I mean, putting LX10 in a Icolite housing 
and you've got a pretty affordable kit that is super, super capable. Um, but I think, you know, one of the biggest questions you want to ask yourself as a new shooter is also just what do you want to do with the camera? Because you'll find the right camera for you by answering that question first. So you want to focus more on shooting stills. You want to focus more on shooting video. That's kind of the first big decision. And then you find different things do different, you know, functions better. Um, but that's also one of the reasons we like the Lumix line so much. Because if you look at our reviews from the last couple of years, you'll see that most often the like all around pick for any specific category is a Lumix camera. Like they do really great images, like super sharp image quality, um, but the video also looks great. And when it comes to video, that natural ambient light white balance capture at depth, like, you know, 50 feet is kind of a good benchmark for testing that. Lumix cameras do very, very well. There's some other brands that excel a little more in that field, but fall short in others. And then there's other camera lines that won't even, you know, get a good white balance down as deep as a Lumix camera will. So there's like different tools for different jobs, but these are an awesome all around pick. So you get something like you know, LX10, LX100 yeah. too, and you've got a pro level capable camera that can do just about anything you want to do and do it well. So I think for, for a new shooter, that's kind of where you want to look, but figure out, whether you want to spend more time shooting stills or rolling video, and then you can kind of find your path forward. Yeah. Uh, I have to say something there as well about uh, yeah. not more, not more, in, not from a technical uh, point of view, but as a diver, if you want to go dive and start to take photos and, or film underwater, uh, it's a good idea to be a good diver before you start, uh, because we sure. are entering an environment that is really fragile and we really have to take care. And either you want it or not, when, as soon as you start to dive and become a photographer or film, film maker underwater, you also become an ocean ambassador and we have to take care of that. So yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's just a side thing. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here. Yeah. Couldn't yeah, agree more. Couldn't agree more. You'll, also, sure. you'll become a better photographer, the better of a diver you become too. Like the yes. more you control your buoyancy and are aware of your environment and, you know, can predict behavior and behave safely and responsibly and communicate with your buddies silently. I mean, like that's when it really kicks into high gear. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That was, that was one of the things I know we've, we've all talked about, you know, beforehand with this is that, like pretty much every other kind of photography, you know, the, the actions of a single, you know, photographer, videographer underwater, you know, can very quickly represent the actions of, you know, how people are assuming others are going to act as well. So that whole kind of comment of understanding what you're getting into is so important. And honestly, I'd say, Unlike a lot of other styles of photography, you know, wedding or events or portraiture, things like that, this category really, you know, you, you really should know what you're doing or go, go to the lengths to actually become educated with somebody who's been doing this for a long time to be respectful of the, the area that you're going to, to not damage anything, not, not leave a mark and just, you know, leave with an image. Don't actually leave anything there kind of thing. Um, with with looking at at you know when someone gets in there and you, you know you've kind of gotten into the water you've you've started you know getting that that kind of bug that you know hey i really like this i want to kind of expand what what typically would a a housing and a setup look like for someone that say is using something like a gh5 underwater Oh, I think we lost Robin's audio. <laughs> okay, so well, the, uh, until he, he gets uh, back, no. I I can uh, kind of chime in there and, and kind of to touch on what Robin said earlier. Um, you know, now is is a great time to to get into underwater photography. Ten years ago, to take something compact. It, it could be done, but the results that you were imagining versus the results that you were getting, um, they weren't the same thing. Now we're kind of spoiled with the technology of the smaller cameras letting you do and get exactly what you're, you're kind of dreaming to get out there. So 
you got to keep in mind that when you get into underwater photography, you have to also factor in a housing, whether it's ours or somebody else's. So not only does that have a, a proportional increase in price, it also has a proportional increase in complexity and travel weight and, and maneuverability in the water. So it, and you have to think about it, whether you're a pool photographer or let's say you're free diving, for example, um, you may want the smaller the smaller camera and what's really cool is that the smaller camera nowadays will get you exactly what you want so i'm just checking in here can you guys hear me yet yeah oh yeah yes we can he's back sorry about that man i saw (laughs) well i saw a comment in the chat that said it sounded like i was streaming from underwater and i realized my (laughs) audio input was not configured correctly sorry about that (laughs) here i am um (laughs) thanks for that feedback no, I think there, you know, really when it comes to building an underwater rig and what all do you need to be successful with it, the main, like the main difference between, you know, should I go compact camera, should I go mirrorless or SLR is that interchangeable lens. Because when dealing with a compact camera, you have your housing that will most likely have a fixed port on it to accommodate whatever that standard zoom lens is that's built into the camera. The difference when you get up into interchangeable lens cameras is then your port becomes removable and you're dealing with a dedicated either wide angle dome or flat port with extension built in for a longer macro lens. On a compact camera, you're using those external wet mount conversion optics. So something that's going to snap on, snap off, rotate thread, however it works underwater for both wide angle and macro. Those also kind of lock you into a, you know, a more limited narrow range. So, but you can also have some versatility of maybe shooting wide and macro on the same dive without being locked into a lens. So you basically have your your camera and fixed lens, housing and fixed port, or you've got your camera body, lens of choice, housing to support that camera body and port that supports that lens. Then you get into your lighting. So, you know, you either wanna have probably two strobes for almost all general shooting, but two strobes for wide angle is essential. You can do one strobe for some wide shots, like vertical shots, or you know, just using one for macro is kind of ideal. We still like to have two, just so you can like change sides, change angles, have a backup, etc. But you've got your lighting, you've got those on control arms. So usually like you know, two arm segments with three joints. So you kind of have the, the same shape that mimics like your own, you know, arm, elbow, wrist get your strobes out there, position them wherever you want, or a couple of video lights when shooting video, see that constant source of light and get some nice, you know, bright pop of color on stuff. Um, You know, I shoot without any sort of external strobes or video lights as well, but, you know, just kind of restricts you a little more creatively. And of course, there's some buoyancy compensation to factor into. So adding floats onto those arms or uh, compensating for a heavier macro port versus a more, you know, air filled big dome port for wide angle. That's when you kind of get your rig trimmed out perfectly, like neutrally buoyant, just like you are as a diver. And then you're like, you know, just hanging out in this like basically zero G environment floating around looking for the perfect composition, you know, kind of not, not being restricted to just standing in one spot, like topside. You're like, Hey, I can get over under and around this thing and just kind of, you know, use one finger to navigate. It's pretty awesome feeling, but that that's kind of what goes into the rig really, you know, it's those, those are the key components. Maybe you add a tripod if you're shooting macro video, but other than that, those are, those are the bits. Take it from anybody who's been underwater, you know, the lighting is one of those things that, if you've never been underwater before, um, you might think, well, you know, hey, I'm going to some tropical sunny location. You don't really realize how water affects your lighting. So it's like like Robin said, having that lighting on hand, uh, it, it will make all the difference between a monochromatic, just, you know, bland image that has nothing to do with the camera. It's just the environment that you're in. Um, and we go, to, we go to a lot of lengths to, to build our strobes so that they compensate for that. And then we also go into lengths to put you know, electronics in between the camera and those strobes so that uh, so that the camera can micro adjust the lighting so that you can focus on your dive and, and most importantly, focus on your composition. Hmm. That is one really cool thing about the Icolite system, too, is how you guys make both the lighting and the housing. And so a lot of cameras will support like electronic TTL sync and stuff like that. It's yeah, you can kind of have a, a completely Icolite rig if you so choose. 
Yeah, it's a dedicated it's a dedicated communication. It's not like your broad stroke TTL. It's it'll actually be uh, an electrical communication with the camera. So. Mm -hmm. See, that's 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 a lot of the stuff I think that a lot of people have kind of like, you know, maybe not understood about about a lot of this stuff is that it is such a different experience. And and I'm I'm curious, you know, there there's obviously a lot changes as you go further down underwater. Um, and for those that may have not, you know, kind of ever looked at this, it, the actual colors disappear the deeper you go down, right? And that's one of the reasons why you need uh, either constant lighting or strobe lighting. But with with the different kinds of sets, and um, I'll toss toss this one out for for whoever um, whoever feels they want to answer it. Um, when when you go down, what what are the typical things that you're you're planning ahead of time to actually like, like get a shot. Because like, like you said, if you've got one camera with the one port and one lens, you know, how, how, how does the planning go into doing something like that? Uh, maybe um, uh, Joe Kim, maybe you can give us some insight on this. Yeah. It's difficult because if you want to change, if you go wide angle, no, if you go macro uh, and you know what a little, what an idea, what you want to do, I think, uh, for example, if you want to take a photo of a clownfish or an animal or whatever it can be, I think that you should actually stay with that object. Uh, you can stay there for a whole dive and you can, you know, you can change angles and you can change strokes and you can experiment. But a lot of beginners, uh, when you start doing this, you just swim around and take photos and you swim around and you take photos and sometimes you can get a good photo. But most of the time, I think I, I would suggest that you stay with the same object till you are pleased. Yeah. And you know, if you go macro, you have to stay macro during the dive. If you go, if you have a SLR camera, if you have um, a, a compact camera, you can do both uh, probably. So yeah, that that's uh, that's how I do it at least. I know what I want to do before I go in the water, and I stick with the plan. I, I have to say I'm guilty when I first started of, of underwater photography. I just, I mean, what do you, what do you need to know? You know, it's underwater. I got a camera and I'll just swim around and take pictures. And you kind of realize at the end of a, a long week long trip that, Oh, my pictures are not all that great. And I didn't get anything that I was imagining. Uh, so I had, as time has gone along, you, you actually start to look and I will actually Google images of what a location will have to offer and then kind of plan my gear around that. And even camera settings and, and techniques and talk to people, call backscatter and say, hey, you know, I'm about to go do this. They'll be able to tell you, it, almost give you a formula for it, you know, of how exactly to do it. And then you didn't, you don't have to change anything other than your approach and you come back with what exactly you were imagining. Yeah, that's it. And I, I would say really when it comes to shooting underwater and like being set for success or thinking about working within the limitations of your given lens, it's not that different than any other kind of topside shooting. If you've just got like a prime lens, let's say, you know, and thinking about using your, your feet to go get closer and zoom instead of using a zoom lens and underwater, we just say, use your fins to zoom, you know? So we like either super super wide angle stuff or super super tight macro that tends to be the most exciting you know so using a big like an eight millimeter fisheye lens and getting close enough to be able to touch the thing that you're shooting is what gives you the best color contrast and clarity in the shot because you're not shooting through a whole bunch of water right like you said not only does color disappear as you go deeper but Clarity is an issue, too, because water is basically a, a big filter with a whole bunch of stuff in it. So let's get as close <laughs> as we can and still be able to see big, big stuff and like fill it in, in the frame, you know, or conversely, when shooting with a macro diopter that's going to give you greater than one to one reproduction ratio and be you know, super high magnification power but with a, you know, a depth of field that's about as thick as a Pringle, then like, you know, you really got to be patient. You got to get in that like sniper mentality where you're like, Hey, I'm going to go get prone in the sand with this one little thing that's just hanging out in the hole doing this, you know, and just walk that focus in and kind of, you know, play with your lighting and 
be ready to spend some time shooting it. You know, that's like John, you were saying, you know, being on a week long trip and kind of trying to shoot a little bit of everything, you can get pretty mixed results. I think going down with one plan in mind and like you were saying, Joaquin, working, you know, to whatever setup you're shooting and sticking to that principle is going to give you better results overall. You're going to come home with more keeper shots instead of trying to shoot everything from the tiniest stuff to the you know largest megafauna. Like you can't do all that and do it well. There's just not the reaction time, the time to change your settings, time to move your lighting. It's like pick one thing and do it for that dive. You know, if you got a lens on your camera that uh, you don't want to be changing in a wet environment, it's like all right, you're going out. Let's say you're doing two boat dives in the morning or something. Now shoot wide that day. You know, if you want to switch it up, shoot macro the next day. But it's kind of, you know, it's funky to think you can do it all on one dive. Though, like we were saying earlier with compact cameras where you can just change those lenses wet underwater, it's nice to have both on hand because you'd never know what's going to show up or you might be diving on a site where you got opportunities for big and small. So you can change on the fly if you want to. Most of the time, though, I just like doing it on the deck in between boats. It's like the convenience of being able to change your optics without having to open a port, break a vacuum, worry about drops getting inside. You know, it's like you can just come up and pop, pop out of the rinse tank into your camera bag and, you know, dive A is wide, dive B is macro. Cool. You did it all. You know, hopefully you brought back some stuff. So different ways to think about it. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things the uh, that, that I would like to tell people, especially if they've never been in the water, is I think you have to keep it into perspective that, you know, even us best divers and best photographers, you know, you're, we're not designed to be in this environment. It takes highly specialized gear. Uh, we have roughly an hour, you know, give or take. So anything you can do to increase your odds of success, and that's usually starting before you even left your location, which is a shot list, making sure your gear corresponds to that shot list. It all sounds very professional, but in reality, that's just kind of just being smart about it so that when you get there, you don't get frustrated. Right. And, you know, making sure that you know the settings for your camera that are going to produce the best results. And like you're saying, that's why, you know, it's like you don't want to just buy your stuff online and then be left to figure it out on your own because no. you're going to be facing an uphill battle. So it's like, hey, call us at Backscatter and go, hey, here's where I'm going. Here's where I'm at as a shooter. Here's the price point I'm working with. Here's kind of the rig I thought, I, you know, looked cool to me. Tell me if I'm on the right track. And then we'll help you build that ideal system and tell you how to set it up, tell you what yeah. the settings are, tell you any of the, the cool little features. It's like, but this one does this, you know, like we really take a lot of pride in you, you don't want to, you don't want to buy this at the, at the duty free shop on your way. Just <laughs> and figure it out. And when you please, get there. <laughs> please don't buy it the day before you leave. <laughs> it's, there, just just you know, drop some... it to me there. It'll be fine. <laughs> Like just like any any camera, you know, the more familiar you are, the more familiar you are with it beforehand and before you get in the water, the more success you're going to have. Because the last thing For you want to sure. do is be underwater on borrowed air and time, fumbling deep into the menus. You know, it's right. like yeah. set the stuff but, you can yeah. set and forget beforehand, and then just work your exposure a little bit while you're down there. Even that, you don't have to change that much. Right. But that, that is super. That is super important. What you're saying that because uh, a lot of people I met. I worked as a dive instructor back in the in the galaxy far, far away. <laughs> Just referring. Um, <laughs> they, they never learn, they learn how to use the camera. So a camera is like an instrument and it's muscle memory. So the more mm -hmm. you practice, the more easy it will be to remember all the settings and all the buttons and all, all you mm -hmm. know. And you start to treat it like a Gibson guitar. In the end, and that's hey. it's practice, 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 practice. So yeah, yeah. And and the best so, camera in the world is the one that you've got. You know, they all do different stuff. They're all different tools for the job, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to buy a new one every year. You're just because a new model came out doesn't mean yours is bad now. They're all good. We've seen plenty of award-winning photos from cameras that were you know several models old. So yes. love love the one you got, but yeah, that's L learn by doing. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but there also, is a also buy new gear from us too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so.
so there's a uh, uh, there's a question in the comments, um, and uh, this one is specifically for you, um, uh, Joachim. Uh, can you briefly describe how you plan an underwater shoot when you're you're obviously getting ready to actually go go shoot? Yeah. Uh, when before I go. What's the I, question? Uh, I the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. the whole how how you're planning an underwater shoot. Okay, so yeah, uh, it depends on what what uh, topic we want to highlight. But I I exclusively work as a conservation film and photojournalist. So uh, we always have a topic to highlight when we go on location or on an assignment. And for example, now we I'm working on a really interesting project together with the Swedish uh, National Symphonic Orchestra, where I'm filming uh, the Nordic countries from from uh, the south of Denmark up to the glaciers of, of Svalbard, underwater on land, and so on. And uh, I know what kind of species, I know what kind of environment I want to highlight. I have it in my mind. Uh, I bring in the people that I know can take me to these places. Uh, expert and uh, we go through everything before we go there and in October now 2019 we went up to I'm coming to that later but we went up to uh, Trondheim in uh, North Norway to film a uh, ghost shot or chimera and uh, th this is, is quite tricky they're deep living species they live down to 2500 meters about 8500 feet but in the night, they come up to 100 feet. So you can go night diving with them. And night diving is a little tricky. And 30 meter night diving is a little deep. So you have to be really careful. But um, we, and ghost sharks, they're amazing, by the way. Uh, in Sweden, we call them sea mouth. It's not as cool as ghost sharks. I prefer ghost sharks. But anyway, so we, we, we plan what to do. I take, I take the guys that can take me to those locations and we go down there and we spend the time just doing that, nothing else. So we, we just, it's like sitting in one spot and just waiting. And so, and hopefully, if you're lucky, you can't uh, compromise the nature, uh, they come. So yeah, it's a lot of planning and it's a lot of discipline and it's a lot of respect to, to what you do. Yeah, awesome, yeah. yeah. So there, there's a couple other questions in the chat here. Um, that that um, that question actually came from Hornbill Studios, so thanks for the the question. Um, one of the other questions that comes up, and I uh, this comes from FC two five two. Um, when you're using an, an underwater housing, does it? Um, he uses the word degrade sharpness of the lens. Um, I, I guess I would more qualify that. Does it change the optic quality of the lenses that you're using? Not if you use the right yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, to I mean, go that's, back that's on like, like what Robin said, yeah, you know, yeah. the biggest thing you got to worry about is the water itself. That's uh, that's people get kind of hung up on on the optics, and and when you get when you really get down to it, you got to really think about the water you're in, and 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 eliminate as shooting through as much of that as you possibly can. Uh, so it's like you said, you want to zoom with your fins. In, in that scenario. Yeah. 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 The, one of the most common things you see is um, in wide angle shots, the corners can get a little distorted, you know, so if like shooting through a big dome, you can start dealing with a little bit of that. So one of the big tricks is to shoot at like aperture of F8 or smaller. So you know, F8, F11, 16, 22, kind of, you know, stopping it down is going to be a factor in preserving your corner sharpness because you're creating more depth of field and, and working with that little, it's kind of complicated to explain quickly, but a, a virtual image in that dome that you're, you know, sometimes focusing on instead of actually focusing on what's out in the water is, you know, kind of a whole thing that goes along with that. But bottom line is you, you can get some distortion and some weird things that, you know, occur underwater, but when shooting wide, stopping down to a tighter aperture is one of the best ways to do that, you know, and that's why like, a lot of times shooting in wide open water, if you, let's say you've got a, you know, a big subject coming through open water towards you and there's nothing to have any corner in the details, you could be a little more forgiving because you can't distort blue, you know, just the color, you know, it's like, there's nothing there. It doesn't really matter as much, but when you're dealing with a reef or a wreck or something like that, you really want it to be sharp corner to corner. Um, 
It's also why you want to use like high quality macro optics too, you know, to make sure you're getting something that is producing the sharpest image possible and, and yeah, nothing fuzzy or, you know, with chromatic aberration or anything like that. Yeah. But in general, so, no, like, you know, you know, just use, use the right port, use the right extension according to, you know, whatever port chart for the system you're using or call us and, you know, we can walk you through how to get the best result, but yeah, no, no significant downside or, you know, bummer when it comes to optical quality just by being underwater. Yeah. So I know um, we've, we have some photos and videos that you guys have prepared. I think um, I, for a lot of the people watching, you know, let's, let's see if we can actually show some of, you know, the, the work that you guys have doing, um, that you guys have doing. I, my, my English is great today. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> Mine is pretty good it's as well. It's been a fun morning. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can we uh, uh, take a look at some of uh, uh, your images, uh, Joe Kim? Yeah, we can try. Cool. Uh, <laughs> we can try and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's start with the, with the um, Chimera, the ghost shark. And uh, I don't yeah. know if it's lagging now. But if it does, uh, you just let me know, and we'll see. Yeah. 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 I think it's so. So for 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 those that are uh, watching, we we are aware that there's a little bit of lag in the in the playback. What I'm going to do is any of the videos that we have uh, or content that we're showing that has uh, online presentations, I'm going to leave a card up uh, on the playback of this, so you guys can actually see this content. Yeah. So so. I'm going to stop there, uh, just pause there and, and go back a little. Uh, yeah. You see, as I told you, we, we, we go there, up north Norway. This is in uh, uh, mid-October, uh, and uh, it's in the, in the night time to, to go night diving because then those chimeras or ghost sharks, they come up quite shallow to 30, 100 feet up for feeding, and they come in uh, a, lot of, a lot of them around. And I think they are so beautiful, and they are rare, and they, you know, they're related to sharks and rays. Uh, but they split up about 400 million years ago, uh, and then it became this amazing, beautiful being. And instead of using video lights here, I have the privilege to have a wingman, uh, Patrick Carlson. So he actually has this uh, more like dive lamp, like a spotlight on, on the object, as you see. And I think for me, the effect of it is like this chimera is like dancing on the stage. Uh, and uh, he's f followed by a spotlight. And uh, yeah, you can see, I don't know if it's lagging, but. Oh, wow. It's, it's amazing when they, when they come. And I'm going to stop here and I'm going to go to the next uh, slide. Bam, I stopped there. Yeah. Because the good, <laughs> the good stuff with, uh, with uh, uh, filming in 4K and working in social media, as we do a lot, uh, is that you can pull a, a frame from, from the footage. And uh, this still photo here is actually pulled, pulled from the 4K footage. And I used the uh, GH5 on this dive together with, uh, okay. uh, yeah, with a Ninja 5. Uh, Very cool. Yes. Uh, so, so that is cool. Uh, and it's amazing, amazing beings. And uh, yeah, I don't know how what what I should talk about here. Of course, you come. This is also a a frame that I pulled from uh, from footage because when I go, I either go still photo or I go video. And for this project here, it's all about filming. Uh, just to tell you a little quick about it, it's uh, together with the Gothenburg uh, Symphonic uh, Orchestra, which is the Swedish National Symphonic Orchestra. And uh, as I said, we're doing a non-flight project. We don't fly a single meter. So we go by sailboat, we go by hopefully electric car and a train around. And it's a logistic nightmare. But, uh, but, but it's cool if we make it. And, uh, you know, uh, Gothenburg celebrates 400 years next year and it should be finished. So we've been up diving with orcas up in northern Norway. We've been around. And we're going to use the whole concert hall as a projection. So when orcas swim over me, it's going to be projected in the ceiling. And we have glaciers on the walls. And we have, you know, 
northern lights in the ceiling and uh, so, so it's going to be it's a really cool uh, cool uh, project and it's also going to be a documentary film about why we're doing this but as you see here nice. uh, wherever you go it's uh, we always encounter a human destructive impact when it comes to the uh, ocean environment and that's that's so sad to see and that's also why we're highlighting this yeah, uh, yeah that's your amel mia uh, he's a hardcore dude this uh, free diving with dry suit is not the easiest thing to do <laughs> uh, <laughs> Cork in the water, huh? <laughs> yeah, and I'm going to just show you some 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 stuff. We, we sailed from a big expedition in November uh, from from Bergen, Norway, up to Tromsø. That's 1,200 nautical miles, and it was the you know shittiest weather you can imagine. It was like, yeah, you can see the stuff there. No, I took that way. So it, it was like storm, <laughs> and it was like super hard, uh, and it was tough because we were four people on board it was a sail vessel 50 foot um and we took turns so we slept for four hours and then we sailed four hours and we slept and it took like seven days to come up there so when we wow. came up i was totally exhausted and then it was my turn to start to work and be in the water diving with orca together with this guy uh, and he is one of the, you know, foremost experts when it comes to polar diving and, and big animals like uh, orcas and wolves and polar bears and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, I was exhausted and I didn't feel my feet for about two weeks. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Yeah. So, so, and also, another thing we did, I'm going to let this roll and... If it's lagging, it's that was Todd Steiner. He's the CEO of Turtle Island Net, uh, Restoration Network, and he's the founder as well. And we went to Cocos Island before Christmas, uh, Christmas, uh, because uh, Todd uh, managed to launch now a swimway between Cocos and Galapagos, where uh, for, for migrating animals like the uh, shark, uh, we focus on shark, and the. Uh, Hopefully, in the in the long run, this will become a marine protected area. Uh, and scallop wow. hammerheads, all the all the sharks there are, you know, they are on the brink of extinction because the the industrial fishing of shark fins are, it's yeah, it's crazy. That was there documenting uh, tagging of sharks, and uh, that was super interesting to to be with world leading experts uh, to do this, and. Um, it's also interesting to, I've never been in the water when they're shumming the water and when they put Oof. out bait. But b before every dive, we went out really early in the morning and uh, we tried to catch fish into the side of the boat. And when we managed uh, or successfully did so, we took the shark into the boat. And what you see on the photo here is a silver tip. And they're quite rare to, to the area of Cookers Island. Uh, they were common before, but they disappeared. But now they're slightly starting to come back again. And uh, the, the, they want to know why. And this particular shark, I was nervous, by the way. You know, there's tiger sharks. There's uh, a lot of uh, sharks around. And uh, shumming water and being in the water was a little like, yeah, I feel something behind my back here. But it's just blue water. <laughs> And yeah, you know, and we, we managed to take one one of the one of the sharks had an old tag from 2013 already, and that was a silver tip. And this is uh, just just to show one of my personal uh, favorite photos. Uh, you see the 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 faction of the hand and the, the fin, and uh, yeah, to me it's uh, I like this photo because uh, maybe because of you know the whole thing. It tells a story. Yeah, it has a story. I want, I want to talk a little about wide angle uh, shoot as well. Just a quick thing. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, and, and corals here, one thing that people do as well, I don't know if it's lagging, you just let me know. But one thing that people, when they start filming, they tend to actually aim the camera down and film the seafloor and no other, uh, you know, references. But if you, if you go down to the same level as the object you want to film, you, you will get a much, much more interesting perspective. 
and you have the blue water here. You have the coral in the foreground. You have a little fish, and you see the you see the surface and and all that. And you know, uh, same here. The coral, the bleach coral here is the is the main object. But imagine if I was above it and pointed the camera down, that photo would have become really quite boring. But if you go in. Mm. Uh, on the same level or a little under so you can shoot up and you have the reference you see the sunbeams you see the fish swimming up uh, you know close to the surface and you have the coral in the foreground makes this photo more interesting uh, I think at least yeah no de de that's that's definitely I, 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 I think that's a that's a good point for a lot of people is that you know just because you're you're underwater you know, the, the composition is one of those things that you just, you always need to be aware of. And I think honestly, in, in this style, I, I think Robin said it before is like, you have so many more angles to photograph something from than you do when you're on land. <laughs> that yes. it's kind of like not an excuse to experiment and play and look and see what, what would frame the best. Exactly. There is. There's a yeah. flip side to that too. I mean, like Joe Kimi did a great job of nailing that like classic black background here. Like that's, you know, it helps him stand out from his anemone and stuff. But boy, is it frustrating when that thing just won't line up right. Or you like, you have something really cool in the worst spot, you know? Oh man. Whew. But you know, we take what we get. It is Mother Thank God Nature's for way. The, uh, the digital era, you know? Now we don't yeah, right. Just, yeah. Uh... Yes. <laughs> yes. It's not. <laughs> what? I. No, I never. I don't ever touch anything up in Lightroom or Photoshop. But it's also, also, you don't have thirty-four. You know, only thirty-four uh, chances to, to to nail a photo. Sure. Uh, one thing I want to say as well: when you take, especially when you take portraits, it doesn't matter if it's on land. But now we're talking underwater, and you will come close to wildlife underwater. Uh, you will. When I do that, I I, I like to set the focus on on the eye because uh, i think that if you can do that um, the, the 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 species itself speaks back to you uh, and that's that's what i like at least so yeah uh, as you see that the yeah so that's what i'm aiming to do every time i take a photo uh, of, of a portrait of an animal or species i try to set a focus on the eye and uh, then you have to just do it till you get satisfied. Over and out. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 really really cool. You know that that whole um, you know the 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 process of going into it and the the images were beautiful. Um, you know, thank you so much for sharing those. Um, just like we said before, for everyone, um, any of the videos that are shown uh, that have online, uh, you know, YouTube links or something like that, I uh, will have links so that you can see them without any of the internet compression that we've got on our side. So most of this, not most of this, all of this stuff really needs to be appreciated in like its highest quality. Um, and I know Robin. Um, I think you had some some videos. Did we want to try those and see if they? Uh, yeah, let's if they play through as well. Let's give it a well? shot here. Let's give it a shot. So, Joe <laughs> Kim, you were showing us some GH five stuff there. So, um, S we, we've got some as well. Both. Oh, okay, cool. I've got some. And G nine. I got some S one R here. We can take a look at. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Let's, let's pop look. this guy open. How's that looking on your end there? Sharing this tab. Let's try this out. So this is hosted on our YouTube hey, channel. There we go. That looks good. Sweet. Hopefully it's playing back okay. So this is a mix of ambient light and video light. This opening clip here was ambient. You can see a little pop of color on the left there from some video lights coming into this one. But I was really blown away by the, like, I mean, I know this is probably the most overused word to describe video footage in 2020 but it was like truly cinematic like it looked awesome the stuff is really <laughs> really sharp um whether you know whether using some some serious video lights or just working with natural light color like this camera produced good stuff and it was good straight out of the camera you know what i mean like i didn't have to spend any time color grading this you know tweaking the exposure i was shooting this camera about the same time in the same location 
as a different, you know, 4K raw capable camera. And uh, let's just say like this, I turned this, I turned this video out a whole lot faster than working with the other one. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, shooting in raw and having some, you know, things like that was really cool, really powerful, no doubt. But for just having something that looked amazing straight out of the rig and like full frame 4K, super, super, just perfect. Not like color was great. I uh, just, I really like this camera. The dynamic range really stood out too. This clip, I've, this clip's probably too long for this edit, but I don't care. I liked it so much. I put it in there because that's my friend Dan. We're inside a wreck shooting in like, you know, just it's pure black, you know, just that little column of light coming out and you just crept out of the shadows and like, it just, it looked so perfect. Um, the macro what, was where really, are you? where are you? This is all, this is little Cayman, um, in the okay. Cayman islands. So this yeah. is all little Cayman during an event that we, uh, we hold there called the digital shootout. It's like the, the world's biggest underwater photo and video workshop. So it's, you know, if you just want to come to underwater camera camp for two weeks, we do that every summer. Uh, so you can find info on that on backscatter.com or the digital shootout.com. But it's just like, you know, nothing but intensive workshops and diving. And it's the single most productive two weeks of my year for creating content because that is my single drive <laughs> while I'm there. So getting out and being able to hang out with these guys, like each the, both the blenny and this little shrimp here, I think both of those were entire dives on their own, um, <laughs> you know, just to get a couple seconds of that footage because dealing with macro can be a little, you know, can try your patience a little bit. Um, but yeah, you know, it's, I don't know. I, I just, I personally, I really love that camera. We had the opportunity to shoot a lot of, you know, either mirrorless or optical full frame 4k slrs you know and there's there's a lot of kind of exciting stuff in that field right now but i really think the s1 was just a rock solid contender like right out of the box you know that yeah. person i was super happy with that footage um we've got uh, another just a quickie one here i want to show too from our lx10 from the more compact one down here this is a, a pretty shorty but uh this was from Bonaire a couple of years ago. And most of this is shot with video lights, but yeah, you know, I just want to give a comparison in overall uh, quality between something that fits in your pocket and something that is, you know, a fully, fully featured camera. So it's like, you know, you don't have to have the biggest, best rig to turn out some stuff that looks really, really good. You know, um, like I said, this has some video lights, which is kind of helping, but as far as white balance on Lumix cameras go, like I wouldn't hesitate to take any of these and go down, you know, easily just pop down to 40, 45, 50 feet and start rolling some clips with natural color. I mean, they like blue, black, blue backgrounds look blue. You know, you don't get that like washed out, like magenta y, purpley thing. You know, when you start hitting your like your Kelvin limit, it's, you know, no, these things look pretty good down to that depth. And then, Again, like even for the still quality too, they're they're amazing. It's kind of like you know, pick the sensor and you know the size of the camera that best fits your budget. And you're going to get some good stuff out of it. Um, like you're yeah, saying, you're... Sean, you know, we we've, we've got those videos and more on uh, you know, as well as a comprehensive reviews on these cameras and a bunch of stills too on our website. So you know, explore there at will. But a lot lot to dive into. What's really cool about that is that uh, you know we, the limitation is as much as you probably don't want to admit it is now you uh the camera is no longer stopping you it's not the quality now it kind of comes down to how good of a diver you are and, and how good you are composing you know those are some pretty fantastic video clips there that really highlight that those uh, abilities i think you know and, yeah. and you know patience and diving in an area where you know you want to go for a target rich environment you know and we've all had dives where we got skunked and just didn't really find that one exciting thing but um you know on the flip side you, you know you go down and you find one exciting thing and that is the one thing you try to hang out with as long as you can it you know no longer becomes about like you know seeing the whole dive site you know and that's where it can get a little tricky underwater too, right? Because depending on the environment and the group you're in and how that works, it's like, well, you know, if you've got a dive master who you've got to stick along with, otherwise you're left behind on the group and you're, you know, you're a risk and a liability at that point. Well, you know, that can be a little limiting. So I think trying to dive with like-minded photographers and in a, in a setup that is conducive to spending time where you need to be to get the shot you're after that can make all the difference in the world. And 
you know, kind of tying back to what we were talking about earlier too, about being ready before the dive. I think you really got to get in that mindset of, I am a photographer that needs to go underwater to create the image I want, right? As opposed to just, I am a scuba diver taking a camera, I'm going to shoot what I see. Like they're both totally valid, totally fine. You know, you can be either of those things and have a great time and take great pictures underwater, but it kind of determines your mentality and your mindset and, you know, how much patience you're going to have with your gear versus how much time you're going to spend just enjoying it with your eyes, you know? So things to think yeah. about going into. But I think the more time you spend underwater with a camera, I know for me, I started identifying as an underwater photographer, not just like a scuba diver who likes taking pictures, you know? Uh, it's it, it can make a lot of difference, especially just for your focus, you know. Yeah. yeah. So there's um, uh, there's one question here uh, from Eric that's asking uh, the videos and and also I, I I'm curious as far as the photos go too. Um, are you guys using autofocus, manual focus? Um, you know the the we mentioned about apertures since that depends on the lenses and the housings that you're using, but. Um, do you guys prefer auto or manual focus or are there reasons why you can't use one or the other? Um, different tools for different jobs. And if you guys want to weigh in on some of your experience, then I'd, I'd be happy to throw some in there too. <laughs> now I can say uh, when I do film, I never go uh, out of focus. It's always manually. Uh, and it's easy because uh, then you control over the focus. And for example, if you have a school of fish in the foreground and you have a big shark in the background and you want to set the focus on the shark, you can just, you know, screw the focus or, uh, yeah, set the focus yourself. Uh, go with yeah. autofocus filming. That will go in and out all the time because it's a lot of backscatter. Uh, you know, <laughs> hey. so, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of backscatter. Some sort of siren of supposed to go off water. somewhere? Is yeah, there's a lot of particles in the water, so they, they you know, the, the autofocus uh, tend to go in and out, in and out, and I, I really don't like that. And also, what, yeah. what um, my fellow friends here have uh, been saying already, you can, you can zoom with your fins, and uh, when you take still photos, you can use, if it's on a portrait on objects, I use uh, autofocus. Cool. Yeah, the thing I mean, that cool. the thing that I warn against a manual focus is is if you, if you're good and experienced um, and you like you said you know your camera very well um, and then that's it's one thing um, the only thing that as a beginner I would advise for autofocus in that scenario is if you rely on manual focus and you aren't doing it right then you could very easily end up with 100 percent of your stuff out of focus I, so I agree with that. True. Very so, true. Good point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one cool thing about all the, like, especially all the current Lumix cameras is that they all have really good autofocus performance. So, like, even if that's all you use, you know, it's going to be rock solid most of the time. Um, Joaquin, you, you mentioned earlier about, like, getting focus on the eye and kind of, like, creating that eye contact with your subject. That's really, like, that is kind of the focus test, you know? Like, if... When, when shooting wide, I think focus can be all about your distance to your subject, right? Because you kind of want to focus on that closest element in the foreground. Um, you know, you, you might need to be at a certain distance from that thing, which is going to determine where your focus point needs to be set. But generally speaking, no matter what distance you are, as long as you're composing your shot properly, you can autofocus on that thing. It'll pick up focus where you want it, and you're good to go. You know, it doesn't mean it has to be in the center of the frame because you can always move the focus point around or then focus and recompose. But generally, that's going to be like your snappiest, fastest method, you know, because if you got a Lumix camera and you're just shooting wide, it's like, why not? You know, like they're going to they're going to do a good job. So just do it. But for macro, <laughs> where like I was saying, man, you know, like that depth of field, like I'm not kidding. It can be like a potato chip thickness, you know, <laughs> like when you're trying to line up a sharp eyeball or pupil on something that would look big on your pinky nail and you've got a depth of field that is a you know a sheet of paper like you know autofocus is going to have a hard time because if that thing is moving at all and if your camera is moving at all or if you're moving at all in the water trying to get autofocus to line up on that stick where you want it is like i mean dude that's a nightmare you know so instead 
set your focus where you want it manually, and then you just push in and out, and you're looking in your viewfinder, your screen, or using focus peaking, which all of these cameras have, which is awesome, and then you know just rely on that peaking and look at the screen and take the snap when you want it. Or if you're shooting video, you know that's when you're going to find a nice, safe place, non-destructive place to place your tripod, and then work out that composition, kind of rack focus in and out until it's looking where you want it. So use yeah. either at different times. It shoot it shoot way more than you think you should in that scenario. It, yes. I, oh, I, please, the yes. reason I even bring it up is from my own personal experience, especially you know you're underwater and you're like. Oh yeah, just nailed it! Like got all of that, I and mean, then you're like, okay, cool. Get some, pour yourself a drink, back in front of your computer, and you're like, oh well, none of that worked out at all. So yeah, that that hits a little too too real. <laughs> I, no, I don't know what you're talking about, guys. No, <laughs> yeah, and then somebody's like, well, what'd you get? And like, oh, I don't want to talk about it. So yeah, yeah, and that. You know, something that ties into that pretty well is kind of always going for that, like, that wide, medium, tight sequence. You know, I mean, it's kind of like the most classic, like, shot sequence ever. That can kind of help with that, too. Because when, you know, you think it's good, it's like, hey, it's pretty good, but can you get a little closer? You know, can you can you get that composition a little tighter? Like, you know, kind of see what you work with and building that variety in. Um, yeah, but definitely, you know, check your shots, too. Don't, don't spend too long missing the action by looking at your viewfinder and your playback. But make sure you got it and you're on the right track before you miss that, you know, once in a lifetime encounter, you know. Again, be be yeah. squared away before you go, you know, know For what you're sure. getting into, have your settings dialed in and be familiar with your equipment. Very true. It's true. And I want, I want to point out uh, a few things as well, again, that has nothing yeah. to do with technical f photos and filming. But when you, when you are when you are in this element, when you, when you do dive, you will come close to wildlife. Sharks, turtles, fish, different different kind of species, and um, in fragile environment like coral reefs and stuff. And if you go macro, you have to be really careful to to you for you uh, keep track of your buoyancy. If you use tripod, make sure you don't put the tripod on corals, and don't chase after animals. They will come to you. So you don't have to change them and stress them out. So I just want to point that out because I think that's important because yeah. we all are ambassadors of our ocean. Yeah, yeah very good point. Yeah, and that's yeah. yeah, that's 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 such an amazing point. You know, I, again, just like we said at the beginning, you have to be respectful of the environments that you're going into. It doesn't matter what kind of photography you're honestly what you're doing in life in general. You should be respectful of the world around you. <laughs> But, you know, in a case like this, your actions can very easily be representative of the opinion people are going to have of other people that are going out and, and shooting. So be smart about it. Be respectful. Understand what you're going into. Um, I think that's that's a, a, a lot of the stuff I know that that you guys have all been talking about. And it's 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 I think something everyone needs to always remember. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Looking at the clock, we are uh, we're a little over an hour into this already. Um, so we're going to actually uh, kind of wrap this conversation up. Um, uh, I know we we didn't get to every single question that's in there, but um, just know that these questions do stay on the um, the chat. Everyone that's in um, in the chat commenting. So if we can answer them afterwards, we'll uh, we'll we'll drop some answers there. Um, I want to go around and. Um, uh, let everybody know where they can see everybody's work, where they can see the products, um, and just kind of follow along. Um, let's start at the what's my my right, which would be Robin. Um, let's start at you, and then we'll go around. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, you know, Backscatter Underwater Video and Photo is the world's largest retailer of underwater photo and video equipment. Uh, our headquarters is here where I'm broadcasting from in Monterey, California, West Coast. And then uh, we also have a location in New Hampshire on the East Coast. Um, but we're available all the time, everywhere worldwide at backscatter.com. That's where you'll find uh, probably the most comprehensive selection of underwater camera reviews and sample footage and sample images, as well as the most uh, up-to-date and broad inventory of any sort of underwater photo and video gear you could ever want. So spend some time checking it out. Uh, we also publish all that same stuff to our YouTube channel and to you know, Facebook and Instagram. So we're everywhere. Just check out Backscatter and uh, 
We're here however you need us. You know, every purchase from us always includes free lifetime tech support, and we dive, shoot, and service everything we sell. So when you call us up and you need some help, you're getting it from somebody who knows exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, let's go to you, uh, uh, Joachim. Oh, you said it right. Wow. Hey, I'm getting better. Wow. It only took an hour. Yeah, it's only the end, but you know. <laughs> I send you goals for later. So, yeah, uh, th there's a few platforms you can follow. Uh, of course, uh, follow the Lumix platforms around the world. Uh, they are everywhere. We are everywhere. And uh, I have my Instagram uh, account, Joachim Odelberg. Sweden, um, I don't have to say that. Facebook, I have uh, private, <laughs> official. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you can also follow... <laughs> Just saying. Uh, I want you to follow Mission Blue uh, on Instagram, Facebook, because they work in conservation and they work with hope spots around the around the world oceans to, to create hope spots for, for uh, areas that needs and it needs to be protected or needs to be highlighted because they are exposed negatively. Uh, Explorers Club, I'm a fellow uh, at the Explorers Club. You can follow them and they will, you know, put up my work and other explorers work. And that's very interesting to follow. It's a lot of the really amazing underwater photographers and filmers there. Um, that's it. Over and out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> oh, did I say that I Last have an Instagram leave. account? Yeah, I said that. Yes. <laughs> <I do. laughs> and uh, uh, last but not least, John, where where can everyone find the products from Michaelite and some of the the work that your team does? Uh, this similar story. Uh, Ikelite dot com, um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, all that. Um, we're based out of the Midwest here in Indianapolis, Indiana. So. Uh, like backscatter, you know, you can give us a call as well, uh, or email us, you know, we're you know, answering emails seems like 24 hours a day. So, uh, so yeah, but we know how, we know how daunting of a task it can be to put together a system. Uh, so if you got any questions about the gear in, in any way, shape or form, don't hesitate to reach out and just be like, you know, what is this or, or why do I need that? Or do I need this? And we can help you out with that. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. So um, I want to thank everybody for uh, taking the time today. I want to thank the, my, my guests today. You guys were awesome. I think this was a really fun conversation, even though we had some of those technical issues in the beginning. But hey, this is the first time we've had four people on and a bunch of mixed media in. So I think we did pretty good. <laughs> um, for everyone in the comments, uh, thank you for joining us again this week for yes. Lumix Live. Uh, thank you. <laughs> as a reminder, uh, we go live every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We will be live next week uh, at 2 p.m. also. Um, I don't have my list in front of me as what the topic is next week. But, hey, if you're subscribed, if you're following all of our social channels, if you're getting our emails, you'll get the notifications of what events are coming next week. So make sure to subscribe to the channel. Make sure to check out all of my guests' content. We will be putting cards throughout the playback of this video we will put links down in the uh, uh description for this video once it's posted on you on youtube live uh and with that i look forward to having the conversation with everybody next week and we will uh see you then thanks for watching everybody thanks for having us thanks for watching thank, thank you, you.